five, four, three, two, one. And Sarah says, go, I go, go, yeah? Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Okay, we've got, this is going to be kind of fun. Tonight we've got actual solutions, because we are in a psychotic world. High blood pressure, high cholesterol. You may have heard that these are diseases, but just for a blast from the past, okay? Now, this was weeks ago, okay? I mean, like, like 40 weeks ago, okay? Can you imagine having a virus so deadly that you had to not walk on the grass? Okay, on the second part of this, because we are going to divide this talk up, and this is literally from Huntington Beach. It was, it's not a joke. Okay, although four or five years from now, people won't remember it. But just know that, that, that some decisions that are made by your government might not be actually based in facts or science. I know. You're going, no! There's no way! My government is so smart. Okay, uh, well, the second part of this, the first part that I think will get by the censors, will be on YouTube and Facebook. It'll also be reposted on library and it'll be reposted in a week so you can get access to all the data. If you wanna watch it all the way through and help support us, beautiful Dr. B VIP, but this one, you can get the handouts, the PowerPoints and share the links because the only way to change this and to turn this ship around is by education and education with facts. It's also going to be um, on Extreme Health Academy, which is ideal. And on this site, you can actually get um, forums where people that have gone through, I mean, just the wealth of knowledge here is amazing. It's not, it's, I'm just one of the small parts of it. Okay, there's a shitload of really brilliant doctors. So when we're talking about blood pressure and cholesterol, what's the function of blood? And, and you'd be surprised because I get a lot of patients in here that are taking drugs to lower the pressure of their body, the blood pressure. And I'll say, what's the function of it? Whoa, never thought of that. So think of it. It carries nutrients, supplies oxygen, balances the pH, and vital to the immune system, um, uh, part of the body's self-repair mechanism. Messengers, it carries hormones, so it tells your organs what to do. I mean, it's amazing. And it regulates the core temperature. Now, what the blood looks like under a dark field microscopy, you can see this bottom left, that's what normal looks like because the red blood cells, they're like two Frisbees glued together. It's a brilliant design. It has a great surface area, can hold oxygen, carbon dioxide, incredible. Under stress, though, they start to clump together. Okay, now there's a number of reasons for this. One, you you're, have low stomach acid, you get not enough available um, acid to break the proteins to amino acids so the blood cells get sticky. There's toxic environment will cause them to get sticky. But think of this. When they start clumping together, can they hold oxygen as good as the same surface area? Or is their oxygen capability decreased? Decreased, right? So does that mean that to get the same oxygen to the same area tissue, doesn't that mean that it, the pressure should increase? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, that would be critical thinking. Oh, your blood pressure is elevated? Why? Nope, that's not done now. Now, it's interesting, stress, psychological stress on serolipid lipid levels. Our conclusion, this means physical, chemical, or emotional stress right here is psychological stress. Mental stress elicits hemoconcentration with associated increases in serolipid lipid concentration, hemostatic factors of blood viscosity. In English, this increases the cholesterol in the blood. It increases viscosity in the blood because stress does that. Okay, Victor, I'm going to piss you off. I'm going to go back. So this right here, I know, I should have told you that earlier. The, the blood cells that are clumping together, that's what it looks like, okay, under a live blood cell analysis. So what is this? It has to do with your automatic nervous system, and this is what regulates your physiology. It regulates your blood pressure. It regulates food through the intestinal tract. It regulates immune system. One part keeps you alive under stress that's sympathetic. The other part regenerates tissue that's parasympathetic. They have literally areas in the body where they exist. How do we measure it? One of the ways is heart rate variability. This will tell you. Do you have a sympathetic dominant, a parasympathetic dominant, or a good adaptive state? Brilliant. I love this. Developed back by the Russians and uh, back in the 60s. So how does physical stress affect it? 
So we know that physical, chemical, and emotional stress will alter autonomic function. And we're talking about blood pressure and cholesterol. So what if you have a physical stress like this? Is that bad? Yeah. And also, so what about correcting that? Okay, literally taking pressure off the central nervous system. So what happens when you've got a structural alteration? This is a body healthy or under stress? It's under stress. So that blood cells are gonna get sticky and clumpy and you're gonna to have to work harder. By correcting this, you're changing the communication to the brain. This is why the Journal of Hypertension of human hypertension 2007, they said, wow, there's no adverse effects to a chiropractic adjustment and it works as good as two medications. And I'm going, well, yeah, except without the negative side effect of lowering your blood pressure with a toxic chemical that increases your risk of stroke. Now the journal <laughs> Manipulative and Physiologic Therapeutics, chiropractic on blood pressure and anxiety. Wow, we just talked about how anxiety can thicken the blood, it's amazing. So we know there's physical stress that causes the body to get that sympathetic or fight or flight state. We know that the health of the blood can also elevate that blood pressure. We know that psychological stress can elevate that blood pressure. Okay, what's a normal blood pressure? Well, you ask the average Joe on the street, you know, they're gonna go, I don't know, 120 over 80. Is it, would, it, would anyone answer 120 over 80? Raise your hand. Okay, one, two, three, okay, three people. What is normal? Where did they come up with this? Does this mean the 12 year old gymnast, okay, and the 30 year old wrestler and the 400 pound cigar store owner, okay, they all should have the exact same blood pressure? Well, it's come up by a joint national committee. No, no, doc, that's how popes are, the white smoke doesn't come out of the room. No, no, this is a joint national committee of hospitals, okay, you know, pharmaceutical reps, everything, and they get together every about 10 years or so and, and come up with what your physiology should be like all the time, no matter what the stress is. I mean, these guys are amazing. So 1997, they said everyone 120 over 80, bam. Then the white smoke comes out, 2004 comes by, and they say it's 150 and over 75. So now do you think that, that in 2004, they said, Bob, I know you were normal back in 97, but not now, buddy. No, 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 you're way high. <laughs> so that lasted for about another 10 years. Then Joint National Committee comes in and says, no, normal, if you're under 60, 140 over 90, if you're over 60, it was 150 over 90. So I was under 60 last year. I'm over 60 this year. So if my blood pressure remains low, should I take something to make it higher? Do, do, do you understand? It's like crazy. Then we look at the Journal of the American Medical Association, patients with heart failure. Now there's 48,000 people in there. Turns out that if you had heart failure, you had higher systolic blood pressure, and that's generally thought to be the output of the heart, that you were lower death rates. Now, why would that be? Heart failure patients, do, they, do, do heart failure patients sound to you like they're super dynamic, healthy, or do you think they might have some problems with the blood? Okay, they've got heart failure, you only got one heart, you're human, okay, so they might have some stressors, right? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so do you think that blood pressure, if you have crappy blood, do you think the blood pressure should go up to adapt? Possibly, possibly. At least this study shows it. Now, what kind of things um, decrease or raise your blood pressure? Well, it could be the time of the day, could be dehydration, could be a full bladder, could be a cold room, could be not drinking, okay, could be drinking coffee, could be sitting, standing, all of that. Like when you're sitting, and you go from sitting to standing, your heart rate has to increase in order to handle that extra uh, distance from gravity in your blood. So blood pressure is changing throughout the day. So what I'm gonna suggest is that we start looking at blood pressure as something that changes dynamically, okay? I mean, obviously the, the official doctors don't have the handle on it because another few more years, it's gonna change again. So what if we look at the pulse pressure, the difference between the high and the low? That, that kind of makes sense. Now it should be around 40 or so, but can you imagine? So like 120 over 80, that's about 40, okay? 
But let's say that, that you're dehydrated. Would that pulse pressure be larger? Yeah, because the blood's not efficient at doing its job. So if we see a larger pulse pressure, something like say 150 over 100, okay, or 150 over 80, that's a difference of 70. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the heart, the systolic, the body working really, really hard in order to get the blood pressure because the blood's not efficient at doing its job. So as that inefficiency of the blood, the output of the heart has to be greater. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? Okay, yeah, so, so when we look at the pulse pressure, if you got like 120 over 100, the body is pumping like crazy to make it. So what does that mean? That's you're under stress. So if we have less of a pulse pressure or a distance between the systolic and diastolic, that's gonna be stress, okay? And that could be physical, chemical, emotional stress. It could be that you're being chased by a tiger. It could be emotional stress. Although we know that emotional stress actually elevates the blood cholesterol and blood pressure. So, so it's a gauge. It's a gauge. The, the number itself is really a poor indicator of health. Now, if you have the higher, the systolic and diastolic, like 160, 180 over 140, okay, that means that the body is working harder again. So it, again, it means the blood is not as efficient as it could be. It means the arteries, which should be clear, can be damaged by toxic environment. Like let's say that you uh, were living in America in 2020, okay. And, uh, you know, you, so the majority of your food, okay, was probably fast food because those restaurants are open. So if you're living in America in 2020, you can't cook, okay, um, single guy without skills or girl without skills, okay, so you're going to eat McDonald's chicken filet or something like that every day. That has toxic products in there that actually damage the arteries. And so that arterial wall can be inflamed and cause other toxic effects because there's certain chemicals in the food that make the food extend a lot longer. It's called shelf life. Not particularly good for you to consume because it does damage the arteries. But, you know, and so the blood pressure might go up. So there's things in juicing called soluble fibers that can actually start to clean the arteries. It's amazing. Or... Let's do this. Okay, now I've actually bought one of these machines called Respirate, and it's amazing because remember, we're talking about blood pressure that goes up and down depending on the need. We're talking about a pulse pressure that will change based on your stress level. Okay, either high stress, low stress, good healthy blood, not healthy blood. So there's a lot of different parameters here. And I know what you're thinking. Well, my doctor just checked my blood pressure and he said it's a little high. Okay, I know that. Okay, because when, when I ever have to get insurance changed or something like that, I don't go to the medical doctor because I don't utilize that for care. I go to the emergency room if I have a broken bone. That's the only time I'm going to see him or I say hello to a friend of mine who's a medical doctor. Okay, so, so for me to get my physical, they got to come here. And so imagine this. Get here at 5 in the morning, adjusting like crazy. Okay, the guy shows up around 9. And I've had a cup of coffee, maybe half a liter of water, and I go in there, okay, and I've been working about four hours, and it's pretty physical work. He checks my blood pressure first thing. And I go in there, and I, say, I just walk in, okay, and he says, yes, it's high. And I said, you know, why don't you give me like five minutes, okay, and I'll deep breathe. And, and five minutes later, I deep breathe, 120 over 80. And I go, yeah, what, what if I didn't say... Let me deep breathe and check it again. Would I be in that category of high blood pressure? Possibly, because there's not a shitload of critical thinking there. Respirate is like ultimate common sense. You deep breathe and you're listening to this tune that, that you'd listen to one tune, breathe in, listen to another tune, breathe out. So just by listening to the tune, you're gonna breathe in on one tune, breathe out on another tune. Now, what's the data on this? Well. It turns out that you're deep breathing 15 minutes one time a day, it lowers your blood pressure all day long. If you do the deep breathing once a day, I mean, you're talking, it's going to lower your blood pressure for forever. Why? Why would that do that? Well, 
When you're deep breathing, I'm breathing it through my nose. Why? Because that's nasal breathing opens up the blood vessels. Okay, it's called vasodilate. It opens up the bronchus. It's called bronchodilation. It helps more oxygen get in there because it's I'm creating nitric oxide by having air going by the nasal, the sinus turbinates. I mean, it's amazing. So if you're nasal breathing, deep breathing for, 10, for 15 minutes, it lowers your blood pressure, not just all day, but if you do it on a consistent basis, why would that do that? Because you're allowing the oxygen transfer. You're getting the blood to be able to, to work correctly. You're getting rid of carbon dioxide, which is an acid. I mean, it's amazing. Now, as we age, we produce less stomach acid, okay? We just do. That's why juicing and blending is super important because that pre-digests the, ju uh, the, the food, helps you break it down because you're only alive because you can break proteins to amino acids, fats to fatty acids, and carbohydrates to usable sugars. So you need that process, but as you age, it's harder to break those proteins to amino acids. So you start to lose the flexibility of your tissue. That's, what, that's why you start to see wrinkling. I mean, this is a typical arm of a 60-year-old. Really? This is just normal, okay? So you need that integrity, okay, of the, of the breaking down of the amino, proteins to amino acids in order to maintain that. What happens is you've got the heart and you've got elasticity and you've got muscle layer inside of the arteries. So you need that bounce because when the heart pumps, the arteries expand and contract. And you need that because the heart is the initiator of the pump. All the arteries in the body are the actual pump. Okay, think, think of, think of any, anyone ever seen wrestling? Oh, you're right. That's a dumb question. No one's going to admit to it. Okay, but, but I know you've seen this where the wrestler runs up against the ropes and bounces off and then he does an arm bar or something, you know, great theatrics, okay? Well, that bounce is the same thing that your heart does. It pushes that, it was that initiator, expands, and then the arteries contract, okay? Well, that expansion and contraction decreases as you age. So as you age, the pulse pressure is going to increase a bit, okay? Not to an extensive amount, but this is normal. It's normal, okay? It's like when I get a 70-year-old you know, Caucasian female, and they say, yeah, they, they diagnosed me with osteoporosis. I said, yeah, you're the thinnest bone person on the planet. Okay, but that's normal for you. Okay, unless you're acidic, unless you're taking drugs, unless you have a toxic diet, and your body is going to the bone bank to withdraw the calcium to alkalinize the system. So there's ways to correct osteoporosis. But usually, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, those are not the primary problems. They're secondary or their body adapting to some type of stress. Does that make sense? Nose breathing, nitric oxide, amazing. It's one of the greatest things that you can do. And you might say, well, how do I check blood pressure? Well, for one, you have to sit down with your arm level with your hand or level with your heart, diaphragmatic breathe. That means you're not breathing like an American, <sighs> okay? Because right now, if you look at your friend, because I know you're going to breathe correctly, okay, look at your neighbor and say, take a deep breath. What's going to happen? Their tummy will go in and the chest goes up. That's horrible breathing. When you breathe in, the diaphragm comes down, the tummy's got to come out. You breathe out, the tummy comes in and the air goes out. So when you're breathing correctly, the chest isn't moving but the bottom is. That way you're utilizing the bottom two-thirds of the lungs, which is the greater surface area. And so you diaphragmatically breathe 10 minutes while your arm is level with your heart, then you check it. Does that make sense? And then you look at the pulse pressure, so that way it's accurate. Now, if you're talking, because what happens when you go to a, a medical office? They're gonna talk to you while they're checking your blood pressure. Talking elevates it. Is the room cold? Could be, that'll elevate it. Do you have white coat hypertension? I do. Okay, that's why I wore one when I was teaching. I wanted to intimidate the hell out of the students. Okay, now I like this. This is, you're, you're not going to see this. In fact, you should take a picture of this slide. This is called common sense. Okay, the first principle of the therapy of hypertension is the knowledge of when to treat and when not to treat. Wow! Wait a second, I just named like six different things and the status of the blood and three different types of blood and saying, look, these are really adaptive circumstances. Do you think you should just take blood one time 
and give a, a, a diagnosis or a sentence to that person? No. In fact, officially, blood pressure has to be checked at three different occasions, at three different times of the day, over a two-week span. Is it ever done that way? Never. Never. You're high, baby. You know, and you're not gonna, you're, we're not going to let you out of the hospital until we get your blood pressure down low. Would that calm you down? Probably not. Okay. Now, I like this. Journal of the American Medical Association. Many current practices that seem logical are without evidence and may be reconsidered and incorporated into a less dogmatic and more patient-centered approach to care. Many current practices that seem logical but without evidence are without evidence may be reconsidered and incorporated into a less dogmatic and more patient-centered approach to care. Less dogmatic. Does that mean that, that not everybody should have the same blood pressure? Yeah, I'm in total agreement with that. Is that practiced? No, not at all. I mean, when you're looking at, oh, say the current fashion, okay, are we looking at the risk of disease or do we just mask anyone over two years old? So let's say we do have a dogmatic approach. Let's say we have these tools in our bag and you have somebody diagnosed with high blood pressure. How effective is this? Now, now again, the quality of your life uh, depends on the quality of questions you ask. If you think high blood pressure is the silent killer and you take a drug to lower that blood pressure, does that put you in the healthy category? Well, if you're not critical thinking, you could say, yeah. Okay, however, is your body self-healing and self-regulating? Yes or yes? So your blood pressure based on your stress level, nutrient level and everything is gonna be here. Okay, now you take a drug to lower it, is the body comfortable with that decreased um, pressure? Or is it going to do everything it can to get it back up there? I don't know. Let's see that. Let's see if we alter physiology with a chemical. Now, this is called medical care. And I know, you know, 100 years from now, they're going to be playing this back and they'll go, no way, dude. Okay, yeah, because I'm going to show you what happened 100 years ago. Okay, calcium channel blockers. Previous work suggests they could increase heart failure. American Journal of Cardiology. Wait a second, so my blood pressure needed to be here. My doctor said it needed to be here. He gave me a drug and it worked, except now it increases heart failure. Beta blockers, this is blocking the sympathetic nerve supply to the heart. If your blood pressure is here and you slow the heart down, does that help oxygen go to the brain or decrease it? Does that help oxygen go to the tissue or decrease it? Okay, so early death, heart disease, cancer, because that more acidic. Let's go to the multiple risk factor trial. Okay, their goal was to get it down to 140 over 90. That was their goal. And they used diuretics. However, the, the group that used the diuretics, now this is something that allows your kidneys to work really, really hard to lose the fluid so the blood pressure can get down. Because if you look at your body as an encased structure and you pour fluid in there, the pressure builds up. You drain the fluid off, the pressure gets less. This is why they do a diuretic, because I know what you're thinking. Doc, you're probably thinking that the diuretic will damage the kidneys because it says kidney damage on the friggin' label, okay? And it will cause your body to lose potassium, okay? That's why when they give this, they give you an MK or omega potassium with it because they know that your body will be depleted of potassium if you use the diuretic and it will eventually damage your kidneys. But this way, um, by, by taking that potassium, you're gonna stave off some of the heart problems, uh, except in this study. Now. University of Alabama found out that for every one blood pressure drug you take, the risk of stroke increases. Why? Well, well, think of this. You've got an artery. Okay, remember the artery is, is part of the blood pressure system. Your heart initiates it, then the arteries constrict and dilate in order to force the blood through and to raise and lower your blood pressure. And in fact, when you're under stress, they're going to constrict to the organs, open up to the arms and legs. When you're in a relaxed state, they're going to constrict to the arms and legs and open to the gut. So it's, it's a transfer because when you're in a stress state and you want to run from danger, you're not want to digest. Okay. In fact, you want to run away from the tiger so you're not digested yourself. No. I think there's probably going to be like four people at home that say, shit, I got that one. Okay, so what happens, your blood pressure needs to be here. What's number, what number is that? 
Nobody knows. It's going to be different for everybody. You take a chemical to lower it, so what's the arteries going to do? They're going to constrict. This is why if you're taking multiple drugs, and this is what we tell our patients, the person that prescribed the drug in this country has to be the one to get you off of it. Okay? But just like your mom would say, did, 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 has anyone ever seen the study of the calcium channel blocker, the ACE inhibitor, and the diuretic all used together? <laughs> there isn't one. Okay, so let's not experiment on each other. Okay, so if you're taking three blood pressure medications or four, I've seen six once. Okay, they're generally about three or four because what happens? You take a drug that lowers it, the doctor's all happy, except the blood pressure's going back up. So you got to take another one. So then you got to take another one. Okay massive increase in stroke. You're as much trouble by the time you're on three medications that achieve excellent control when has when you all have hypertension and it's untreated, which is amazing. We want to raise the issue that despite great advances in pharmaceutical approach, relying solely on this approach is going to come at a dear price of people's lives. Absolutely. So let's use common sense. If you're taking two drugs, try and check your blood pressure correctly by deep breathing try and get a live blood cell analysis by somebody that can read it, okay, not a, not a CBC or a complete blood cell count, and, and separate the drugs. You know, you still got to take them because you're under the authority. You've abdicated authority over your own health, and you're using the medical system that utilizes chemicals to alter your physiology. Oh, let's look at that. How, how, how effective is that to gain health? Well, according to the Metabolism of Clinical and Experimental Journal, you can have epigenetic changes, okay, and drugs like cholesterol-lowering drugs, antidepressant, beta blockers, blood pressure drugs, all of these drugs cause alterations in how your body expresses itself, okay? Which, which like in English, what does that mean? Well, it means diseases like heart disease, cancer, mental disorders, diabetes, obesity, leukemia, schizophrenia, infertility. These are the end results of taking those medications or, or the medications are a contributing factor. How important is that? Well, about 20 years ago, the medical field, and this is um, the, what, it, it, this isn't malpractice, okay? This is actually the medical field, okay? You're talking the third leading cause of death, okay? And this was 1999. Uh, but also, if you look at the drug, the right drug at the right time in the right um, dosage, so everything is done right, kills 128,000 people a year, minimum. Now, I was in New Orleans. This was way back. I'm talking years ago. We had these big things that could fly across the country. You didn't need to wear a mask. It was amazing. You'd get off the plane. You'd go to New Orleans. You'd go to Bourbon Street. You'd listen to jazz and everything. You'd be bumping elbows. You know, you'd be checking for pickpockets. Okay, they have the pharmacy museum over there, which I totally dig. And I saw this Collier's article, Patent Medicine Fraud. And that's what, that's what they used to call prescription drugs. Now, deadliest drug in America is Tylenol. Okay, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Do you know where it came from? I was reading this article from 1905, okay, and this is where it came from. Okay, now, uh, acetin ilide uh, was the first introduced into medical practice in 1886. But its unacceptable toxic effects, the most alarming being cyanosis due to methylglobulinemia and ultimately liver and kidney damage. After several conflicting results over the ensuing 50 years, it was established in 1948 that acetanilide is metabolized to paramancinol or acetaminophen in the human body. Acetanilide is no longer used, has a drug in its own right, although its metabolite paramancinol is the number one pain reliever in America. It's also the leading cause of liver disease, and it's really toxic. Now, this was part of the article, okay, in 1905 in Collier's Magazine. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's just, it's amazing because you're, you're doomed to repeat the same problem unless you learn from it, okay? And we are not learning from this. Acetanilide will undoubtedly relieve a headache, and certain kinds of acetanilide has the basis of headache powder. So this is where it was used, headache powders. is prone to remove the cause of the symptoms by permanently putting a complete stop to your heart. 
action. Invariably, it, it, when taken steadily, it produces constitutional disturbances of insidious development, which will result fat fatally if the drug is not to be, um, is the drug be not discontinued and often enslaves its devotees to use. Cocaine and opium stop pain, but the narcotics are not the safest drugs in the world to put in the hands of the ignorant, particularly when the presence is concealed, has cough remedies, soothing cervix, um, powders, for which they are the basis. Opioid crisis, we're still in. One of the leading causes of death in America is altering your physiology with a chemical. That's called medical care. Um, over a hundred years, they've been using amalgam dental fillings. This came out in September, just a few months ago. The FDA said, holy moly, putting a neurotoxic substance in your mouth causes damage to your nervous system. Now, I, I know you're thinking that, that, oh my God, the medical system, he's got a white jacket, you know, he's probably resides in the clouds. Anything my doctor says, anything they want to put in me or anything, it's sanctified. Well, they made a mistake here, didn't they? Okay. So if you do have amalgam fillings and, and you know, I had them when I was a kid and I didn't take them out until I was 40, you got to take them out correctly. You got to get a Huggins Protocol dentist. They're toxic. They're nervous. They're neurotoxic. Nursing women, infants, pregnant women, children and people with neurologic diseases or impaired kidney function, I have a heightened, or I have a heightened sensitivity to mercury and other amalgam components. You need to get those removed. The other people that aren't listed on this, wait till you develop symptoms and then remove them. Okay, thank you, doc, okay? No, that's dumb. You have something poisonous in your mouth, get rid of it. Aspirin, have you heard of the aspirin today for a healthy heart? Okay, let's look at this. Um, Eric Topol, brilliant guy, I love this article. The American Heart Association isn't backing off, even though you see the 1.5 grams, okay? You get less heart illnesses and heart attacks and diseases if you have more salt. Okay, so why aren't they gonna take, change their recommendation? But I think there's a big lesson about guidelines without adequate evidence. They can do harm. Hopefully this lesson will prove to be impactful because that certainly has not been the case to date, as in cholesterol, blood pressure, PSA or prostate-specific antigen, mammography, and a very long list of poorly conceived, non-anchored guidelines. Isn't it about time we recognize that there shouldn't be rules for populations, that some people are exquisitely sensitive to salt intake while others are remarkably resistant? The average is over. Oh my gosh, think of that. You're going to treat each person as an individual? Revolutionary. Okay, garlic may provide an ideal alternative to aspirin in preventing hardening of the arteries. Amazing. I even like it. Cholesterol. What's the function of cholesterol? If you have a doctor that says, well, it clogs arteries. Okay, 50% of your brain is cholesterol. The cholesterol is the precursor to every hormone you make. That means every glucocorticosteroid, medicocorticosteroid, and sex hormone is made out of cholesterol. Um, memory, brains, everything. So now what happens? If you can see this, this is a diagram of an artery. Now the cholesterol is forming underneath the endothelial layer, underneath the inner layer of the artery. So it's not even where the blood flows. So why would it form there? And how come cholesterol doesn't clog veins? Because when we're checking cholesterol, we're drawing it out of the veins. So where is it coming from? Wouldn't, wouldn't you be kind of curious? <clears throat> the arteries have, have arteries. They're called vasovasorums. That's the arteries have a muscular layer. So they got to get arterial supply to supply that muscle. Now, if you're taking toxic products, okay, that masquerade as food, something that will last on the shelf for weeks or months or years, okay, they pretty much, I mean, bacteria won't eat it, but you will, okay, so they are eliminated the digestive and metabolic enzymes. However, that can cause free radical damage. It's not going to be a healthy product, okay? Does that make sense? And it's going to create an inflammatory process inside of the body. Now, the inflammatory process can also clog the arteries that supply the arteries. Why? Because it's in the blood. 
you've got these these histamines, you've got you've got all of these free radical formations from the from the formation of this, and free radicals can damage the arteries. So you get that damage to the artery. Now there's a lot of pressure in the in the arteries. So if you have that arterial pressure there that wants to expand out and blow, but you're damaging the artery that supplies that muscular wall that holds that area together, the body's going to lay down a protective coating, a cholesterol, calcium, and, and fibrin. Okay, does that make sense? So it's a protective mechanism of the body. This one, the role of oxidative modifications in atherosclerosis. I mean, this is brilliant. All polyunsaturated oils uh, provide a, a source of free radicals and can damage their arterial walls, which initiates the plaque buildup. Vegetable oils constrict the blood vessels and increase platelet stickiness, which raises blood pressure and causes further damage to our arterial walls. Why would the platelets, um, you know, that why would the, the, the arterial damage cause an elevation of blood pressure? Well, you get an artery like this, you damage it, the placking occurs, so does the, the volume of the artery decrease because you're filling it up with plaque? Yeah. So can you imagine the doctor that, that doesn't look into this? Okay, the doctor that is just following by rote, that doesn't have critical thinking, that just says, you have high blood pressure and I'm not going to look at why. And your body is adapting to try and get the same amount of blood through that damaged artery and your blood pressure is getting higher because it's got to get the same oxygen of the tissue and it gives you a drug that forces it down low. No wonder strokes increase with blood pressure drugs. Mind blowing. The British Medical Journal, the, the lowering serum cholesterol concentrations does not reduce mortality and is unlikely to prevent coronary heart disease. Claims of the opposite are based on preferential citation of supportive trials. You're going to see this. You're going to see this a lot in medical literature that a lot of the medical literature is not based on objective science. Okay, that scientists want to be published. They have to get along. They have, to, they, they have agendas. Their labs have to be fun or, or furnished and, and funded by certain groups. Okay, does that make sense? Um, expert review of clinical pharmacology. Statins stimulate the hardening of the arteries, okay, arterial damage, and heart failure. Thus, the epidemic of heart failure and hardening the arteries that plagues the modern world may be perioxidally be aggravated by the pervasive use of statin drugs. We propose the current statin treatment guidelines be critically evaluated. That was six years ago. Anybody think they're looking at that? Anyone think they're saying, wow, Bob, it looks like cholesterol has its own function. Turns out it's 50% of the overall weight of the brain. I know half our population has cancer. It couldn't be because we're over-medicating them, could that? No, because we give them the drugs and their physiology is normal. We're not looking at the stressors that cause their body to adapt to that. Mind-blowing. Archives of internal medicine did not find evidence that the benefit of statin therapy on all-cause mortality. 65,000 people. Statin therapy, cholesterol-lowering drugs, decreased heart muscle function. It increases pre prevalence of an extent of coronary plaques. Um, uh, muscle weakness, polyneuropathy, that's a big time deal. Why? Because you use cholesterol as the precursor of every glucocorticosteroid, minocorticosteroid, sex hormone, and it's 50% of the overall weight of your brain. It's one of the most important things that you've got. Now, humans are actually programmed to be active. So what am I suggesting here? Am I suggesting that high blood pressure is not a concern? No, it's your body adapting to physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Should you be able to correct the stressors first instead of taking a chemical that might have toxic, deadly effects later? I know, you wanna say it with me, duh. Okay, <laughs> exercise prevents plaque development. No kidding, so does that mean oxygen, breathing, working out? Yeah, it does. Why? Because you're increasing the blood pressure, you're detoxing the oxygen, you're breathing. You know, I've, I've never seen a great, I mean, there's certain athletic studies that have hypoxia where they put a mask over their face and exercise, but these are top level athletes. No reference to society today. Um, regular exercises, angiogenesis, that means it forms new blood vessels, neurogenesis, new nervous system, synaptogenesis, that's how they connect, and synthesis of neurotransmitters. Guess what neurotransmitters are built out of? Okay, cholesterol. 
walking grounded. You're kidding. Grounding? Why? Because the earth has an electronegative charge. It's like taking an antioxidant by having your skin touching the earth. Grounding appears to be one of the simplest yet most profound interventions for helping reduce cardiovascular resist, uh, risk and cardiovascular events. Um, fruits and vegetables. Wait. So when the doctor checks you and he sees high cholesterol and high blood pressure, or if he's really advanced, he sees a greatening or a distance of that pulse pressure to 50, 60, 70. Is he going to say, wow, how are you sleeping? How's your bowel movements? We got to increase your fruit and vegetables. We got to find the physical stressor. We've got to send you over to the corrective chiropractor to look at your, your nervous system and your structure. Is he doing that? If not, you can fire him now. Soon in our socialistic America, you're not going to be able to. You're going to have to suck it up and go to the one that you're supposed to go to. Okay. And if you're not going to do that, we have places for you. They have them in Canada. Okay. Yeah, that's what I want you here in California, buddy. Okay. Journal of Nutrition. Among all the fruits, berries have been shown to have substantial cardioprotective benefits due to their high polyphenol content. So does this mean you've got to stay away from vegetable oils and eat more fresh fruits and vegetables? And you exercise and look at your structure, and this will help your body not adapt to the high blood pressure. Your body will start to detox, and you're, you're actually getting the stuff you need. I know, it's such a bizarre concept. Nut consumption. Higher nut consumption may reduce cardio, um, coronary heart disease. Reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, total cancer and all-cause mortality, and from respiratory diseases, diabetes, and infection. If you take higher nuts, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. Know that high blood pressure and high cholesterol are not diseases. I'm waiting for a lightning bolt to strike. Okay. Okay. They are adaptations to stress. If you... Change your physiology with a toxic chemical without addressing the stress, the outcome is not good. Okay, and I, I know 50 years from now, okay, people will, this will be common sense. You know, right now there isn't much. Okay, so we just got to change it. Now, we are going to start um, going into the censored version. I have one slide and, and this, if you're on Dr. BVIP, you won't see an interruption. If you're on Extreme Health Academy, if we're, if we're streaming there, I don't know if we are this week, you won't have any interruption. And if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, it's gonna shut off in a couple of seconds. Um, I'm sorry I can't share this information, but I am gonna share this one from Tel Aviv. Okay, so while you're wiping it out, it turns out that I'm, I'm, 